Mini episode 843 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a joint episode of Sportsology Radio and the FDH Lounge, specifically FDH Lounge mini-episode 843. Rick Morris, Russ Cohen, your FDH Lounge dignitaries. Russ, also the proprietor of Sportsology. He is headed to the Stanley Cup for uh, coverage of the games here. Every year, of course, he gets to check out the Eastern Conference games, generally speaking, and cover them uh, wherever they're at this year. Maybe uh, both rounds with uh, the the Stanley Cup final being as far west as Nashville. It doesn't happen very often, Russ. Uh, have a, have no. a great time uh, covering it here. I know that you will. Uh, how much you covering this year in person, my man? Well, I'm going to cover the, the first two in Pittsburgh for sure. I may have someone fill in Game 5, depending on the, uh, the way the series is turning. Uh, I may go to Nashville for Game 6. So that is a, a real possibility where, like you said, if it were Anaheim, I'm probably not doing it. So it's... Interesting. I, I think, you know, Nashville's been one of these just unbelievable markets. We have to give them a lot of credit because as we head into an expansion year with the uh, Las Vegas Golden Knights, Nashville was one of those teams. They were the last one of those teams. And while everybody is going to paint this rosy picture of the Las Vegas Golden Knights having the greatest expansion team in the history of expansion teams, which I think uh, it remains to be seen, uh, we'll, uh, we'll find out. But in the interim, this is the first time Nashville's made it to the Stanley Cup. They've really earned their trip, and the fan base has just been rabid. Just to give you an example, not to hate on the Ottawa fan base, but they outdrew the Ottawa fan base. That's something. That really is. And even for a market where you could look at it and say, well, you could say only show in town, uh, Major League Sports-wise, but still, that, that to, to outdraw uh, good old Ottawa there, particularly in a year of great success for them, albeit most of the success came in the playoffs, much like Nashville, but you could kind of say the same thing. Nashville comes into this, people want to point out and say the number 16 seed, if you were looking at it for the entire tournament here, so that's a very yeah. apples-to-apples point of comparison you just made right there. Uh, the Nashville fans didn't have any real reason to suspect this run in the postseason, same as the Ottawa fans didn't on their side. Right, and the interesting thing is, while talking to plenty of people in Nashville, like my good friend Pete Weber, I, I, I did name drop there, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he did let me know that the Titans are back on the rise with Marcus Mariota, so it's not like there's no competition, it's just that there's no competition from an NBA team. That's or true. That's true. You know, I was a little dismissive there of the Titans, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right to point that out. They're, uh, I, I'm used to being dismissive of them, but they do seem to be headed in the right direction uh, at this point in time. But still uh, remarkable. This is only the second, uh, when you look at the big four sports in North America, only the second time that any team from Tennessee, and of course the other team from Nashville making it a couple of years ago, more than a couple of years ago at this point, Super Bowl, 34, the uh, Titans and the Rams. I was joking with a friend the other day that when you have the any kind of thing going back to, I, I tend to think of the Royals and the Cardinals in 85, anytime there's two teams that are separated by not that much geography, I remember that I think they picked a town in Missouri, the media did, and they went there and it was like half fans of one team, half fans of the other team. If we were to extrapolate yeah. the same thing, Russ, I doubt you're going to find a town in Kentucky halfway in between its half Predator fans, half uh, Pittsburgh fans. No, it's true. I mean, that's what I'm saying. This is an interesting thing with the two fan bases because everybody will look at Pittsburgh and say, yeah, they're the known fan base and they, they, were, they won the cup last year and they're, they're shooting for a real dynasty mode now. We'll see if they're, if they're up for the task. Where Nashville, they're going to be happy to be there 
as a fan base, and so the, their team really won't be able to do any wrong. As far as the actual team, they've got a real good chance. They've got a Stanley Cup winning coach and a guy who's been there as recently as 2010 in Peter Laviolette. And so this, this makes it a really good matchup in the sense that people will always try and poke holes in it and say, well, they could have a better TV matchup and everything else. Yeah, that's great. I get it. Look, even if you go to the NBA matchup, it's not like Golden State is a great TV market. It's not. It's just the NBA draws more, so they'll be fine. Pittsburgh is a great TV market, so actually they will drive the bus on this. Well, that's true. That is the case. And it is interesting, and I sort of agree with what you're saying about Golden State, but it's one of these things, I, I know you would probably agree with this, you look at the San Francisco Giants, that it is a matter of awakening a sleeping giant market-wise when you have a very good team. And in the case of Golden State, they carry Oakland with them as far as a market goes. And I think to whatever extent you've seen this locally, Philadelphia Phillies in baseball. Philadelphia, a decent-sized market. You were sort of awakened the, the, the giant there. So we don't really have that in this a matchup here in the Stanley Cup Finals, albeit Nashville is certainly a growing market over a period of time. Pittsburgh is a decent-sized market. And as you say, nationally, that is probably going to end up carrying this thing. Uh, I think the network executives in their dream of dreams might have liked to have Pittsburgh-Chicago if they could have. And then you start getting into a little bit more of uh, team of the decade talk if it comes to that. But I've already heard a surprising amount of it for Pittsburgh if they win this just because it would make back-to-back. And I'm sitting here going, you know... I don't really know about that. you got Chicago that's got three of them this decade. To me, that still trumps back-to-back. I think Pittsburgh's got more work to do, even if they win this thing. Yeah, I mean, look, the three by Chicago is a big deal, but it wasn't like in a dynasty mode. To me, a dynasty mode is consecutive. Like, I, that's what I grew up with. That's what it is. And so if Pittsburgh is too consecutive, they'll be the first since your Red Wings, and they'll be on that way to an actual dynasty mode. Not to mention... Some of these guys have won the cup with them previously, like Sidney Crosby and Getty Malkin, so and Mark Andre Fleury. So you know, I just I think there will be some work to do, but if they win two in a row, it's. I mean, the one thing I think listeners will agree on: it's a lot harder to win the Stanley Cup every year to try and be a dynasty team than in the NBA because there's a lot more moving parts. The NBA, you got less players in the lineup, but if you've got three or four superstars, you're in better shape. Absolutely. I think there's no question about that. And there are just there are some things about this matchup this year that, that speak to some of the unique aspects of hockey and, and the way that it goes. And I would say in a lot of ways, and in, 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 in something that should be interesting to discuss for you, uh, baseball. Because I know for you personally, when we're looking at the big four sports in North America, those, those two kind of sort of sort of tend to be top of the pyramid for you. You, you look at it yeah. here, and the, the, the Stanley Cup uh, tournament in recent years here, it seems to be a lot similar to the way that MLB has gone in terms of, uh, you know, you just have to kind of make it in there. Really, anything yeah. can kind of happen once you get there. Nashville being the 16th seed and advancing as far as they have, in a way, it sort of reminds you most recently in sports. You've got the Kings that did it when when they first advanced as an eight seed, the first of their championships. I also am put yep. in mind the 2014 World Series, the Royals and the Giants, both as wild cards making it there. So Pittsburgh making it on the one side was, again, I won't say necessarily predictable because especially coming out of that monstrous Metro division, there's a couple of teams that could have been at this point and you wouldn't have been that surprised necessarily, but... That's the only thing I think Pittsburgh making it as far as they did that keeps this from being as feeling as disconnected to the regular season as it might otherwise. Because some years you get that with the Stanley Cup final, where it really does kind of feel disconnected to the regular season, and the success that Nashville had just puts me more in mind of that. Yeah, I I, I think all of that is is totally fair, but I I will say this: yes, you always want to be the hot team down the stretch. But like you said, the the Metro was a war of attrition. When I started the season, I went with Pittsburgh and Chicago. I I had a chance. Many people gave me a chance to jump off the Chicago bandwagon. And me being me, I didn't do it. So only half of my predictions in there, but it's a pretty good half. Yeah. And and the thing is, it's just, look, in the the Metro, like you said, Rangers, Washington, I'm not going to go as far as Islanders because they didn't make it. 
Rangers and Washington, either of those teams advance. They go to the Stanley Cup final. Nobody would say boo. So you're right about that. And so that's the part that at least makes the regular season worthwhile because Pittsburgh had to go through that. And, and to be honest, I think Pittsburgh has had the tougher route to the Stanley Cup than the, uh, than the Predators have because I think ultimately the uh, Pittsburgh really had their hands full almost their whole time in the playoffs so far. I would agree with that completely. I was making an analogy the other day to somebody who doesn't follow hockey as much, and I was talking about Pittsburgh-Columbus in the first round. I said, picture Warriors-Spurs in the first round, but without uh, uh, Zaza Pachulia accidentally on purpose injuring uh, Kawhi Leonard uh, and and having a real matchup of the Warriors and Spurs in the first round. Uh, Pittsburgh and Columbus in in the first round is something that uh, really should never happen because that's a matchup that, uh, you know, conference finals at the very least, you would think, for the kind of year that they had as far as matching up, but that's the way that this seeding system delivers it to us. If you have a division that stands head and shoulders above the other three, you're going to get that at this point. Hence, certainly on paper, Pittsburgh faced its easiest opponent in the conference finals, which is very strange to say in any sport. Yeah, no no question, and and Columbus did have a great year. I didn't pick them against Pittsburgh, obviously, but... I knew that with John Tortorella there and, and the young talent they had and the good goaltending, that they would give Pittsburgh all they can handle. Then Washington clearly, you know, threw a lot of haymakers at, at the Penguins. So, yeah, they've, they've really earned their way into this. I mean, there's no question about it. They have had enough injuries to overcome just to just to get there. And, and now they're here, and their fans are, are really thrilled about it. Ottawa fans, not as much, but Ottawa threw some haymakers at them, too. I mean, like I said, Pittsburgh has really had the tougher path. Nashville has had a tough path when you consider they had to beat the Blackhawks, and nobody thought they would. I didn't think you know, a lot more pro Nashville down the stretch here. And, boy, Pecorine, who was an eighth-round pick by the Nashville Predators, looks like an awfully smart pick by Jeff Kielty, their director of amateur scouting, back in the day. And that's something where I think they deserve a lot of credit because they have one of the better scouting departments, and that's what's really gotten them here. Absolutely. And uh, before we uh, steer into some of the X's and O's a little bit here in the matchups that I want to ask you about, I, I want to zero in specifically on what you were saying about Nashville and getting past Chicago shockingly sweeping them in the first round, something really that nobody saw coming if they were being completely honest. There might have been a handful right. of people out there who thought they could have won the series. Nobody thought they were going to sweep it. Here's the thing. I, and, think, people, I think people with tinfoil hats would have said they, that they were, they were going to sweep them, and, and you know, nobody would have listened to them. Well, and here's the thing, too, and this is a question that's going to sound like I have an axe to grind. Uh, and maybe I do, but it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. I think back to the coverage. I'm going to go back to 04 and 06. My Detroit Red Wings losing to the Flames and losing to uh, Edmonton in the first round, respectively, in those years. Everybody's screaming, choke, choke. In retrospect, I think it was just kind of borne out. You look at the run the Red Wings went on later in the decade. They had some work to do. They got exposed yep. by teams that were younger and faster. They were at that transitional point between their cup runs in that decade. I looked at it at the time. I said, I think it's unfair. If a team goes on to win the conference, to me that retroactively removes the choke tag from it. And I think in this case, I think people recognize that with Chicago right away. They got some work to do for next year. There were some things that were exposed. People were being a lot fairer, quite frankly, to Chicago, and I'm not going to say they're wrong, but they're being a lot fairer to Chicago than they were to the Red Wings when they lost to the low seed both times in a very similar circumstance, I think. Yes, but I think what still gives that kindness to the young core that they still have, even though these guys have been through the wars, and we're not counting Hosa because he's not young, you know, Keith, Seabrook, Cage, Kane, they're not that old. Right. And that's why. Well, that's true. That's true. They're, they don't have as much to work to do, I think, as the Red Wings of the mid-2000s to get back uh, to the top right. here. So 
th there's that sense as well. But yeah, it's more a sense, I think, that people are giving credit to Nashville, which I think should be the case and should have been the case with the Flames and Edmonton back in the day. If a team goes on to win the conference, you take your hat off to them. It's not a choke to lose to the team that goes on to win the conference, if indeed that's how it plays out. And that's what happened with Nashville. And they're getting the respect that they deserve, I think. And you, you go into this, and yeah. again, it's, it, it's easy to sit here and draw parallels to other sports and everything, but I, I just can't help doing it when I look at this because there are things that it seems like you wouldn't see in other sports. With Pittsburgh not having Latang in there, making it to the finals, with uh, Nashville not having Johansson in there, uh, I, I'm hard-pressed to think of an analogy in other sports. I know you had the Packers when they won the Super Bowl after the uh, uh, 2010 season, I believe, when they had like 15 guys on the DL and Jermichael Finley yeah. among them. But you don't tend to see this, I think, in other sports as much where top, top guys are not in there and represented at the end when the team is left in the uh, championship round. Yeah, I think the, the league that you have the biggest chance of that is the NHL. But, but because, like you did point out, and I think it's definitely that, it is a lot like MLB. I think that they have the same chance based on their playoff system now, too. So, yeah, I, I think that's that's really well put. Now, next year, <laughs> next year, am I going to go with Pittsburgh coming out of the East again? I don't know. i got to see what happens in the expansion draft, but it's a point well made. Well, that's that's excellent point on your part because uh, when you look at the and, and when you look at the meat grinder of making it this far into June, it would be hard to pick them next year, regardless of what happens here. But uh, MLB, yeah, uh, my Cleveland Indians. I go back to last fall, and you're absolutely right about that. No Michael Brantley, uh, no Danny Salazar, no Carlos Carrasco, et cetera, et cetera. So you're right that that that, that just sort of I think reinforces the tie between MLB and NHL as far as the structure. Yeah. Uh, of what happens, and you get to this round, and uh, again, it is one of these things, and I've, I've seen the uh, comparison made, I, I believe it was an article I was reading on ESPN.com, where they were saying, this is going to go a long way towards uh, settling the question, or, or at least in a tangible example, settling the question, not that anybody ever can once and for all, because it's a matter of opinion, but what would you rather lose? Would you rather lose a, a top, top guy on the blue line, or would you rather lose uh, an excellent a uh, young center on his way up, becoming one of the best players in the league. Uh, and what's uh, further more interesting about that is that Pittsburgh, uh, again, what they're left with, their strength obviously going forward here. I mean, you could look at goal and you could look at the way that uh, Murray and Flurry have played in the last two postseasons and say that, but we're still, we're always going to look at Pittsburgh and say the strength obviously comes in the forward core. You look at Nashville, what's left, uh, and it's the other way around. The strength in what's remaining is on the blue line. I think the best blue line in the league, uh, certainly at this point. Uh, not that uh, if, uh, Nashville doesn't have strength, obviously, still remaining at forward, but it, it gives us this sort of offense versus defense matchup because of what each team is missing here that, again, is oversimplifying, but that's at least going to be the narrative going forward in terms of what each team brings uh, in terms of remaining players at this point. Well, I don't know. You see, here's the funny thing. It's really still offense versus offense. It's just that Nashville derives a lot of offense from their defensemen. Yes. Not that they're not good, not that they're not good defenders, but the way Peter Laviolette plays hockey is he gives those offensive defensemen a lot of leeway. So like a guy like Ryan Ellis now, not in the shadow of Shane Weber, has really been able to show off the same kind of talent that he had in junior hockey when he was racking up major points. And then I guess probably for a few years, people in Nashville were wondering, would we ever see that Ryan Ellis again? And part of it was because of the log jam that they had on the blue line because of all the drafting. Well, now that log jam doesn't exist anymore. And P.K. Subban is there. And P.K. Subban, while he is still a good defender, still the best part of his game is the offensive game. So I think I think that's still their big thing is to is that's where they have this part beat without Chris Tang. They have more offense coming from the blue line, so that's that's a little bit of a plus for them. The, the downside is, yeah, they're missing at least center and Ryan Johansson, or like Fisher makes an appearance like he's supposed to. Yes, Fisher is supposed to, and uh, that is definitely going to go 
uh, some way towards neutralizing it. But but again, one one doesn't just simply replace Johansson. And you're right, uh, Nashville. One of their big strengths has been getting the uh, the offense from the blue line and the production that they've had there. And I have to tell you that uh, this is a sore spot for folks like FDH Lounge dignitary John Adams, who's a big Habs fan here. You look at the trade of Subban, which, again, to a lot of people never made sense in the first place from the Montreal perspective. Here he is in the Cup Finals, and you look at it, and one of the things that's kind of intriguing to me is him being a guy, and again, you look at uh, deals made the last couple of years the uh, between the teams uh, here, the, uh, the Neal deal. So you have some guys on both sides, I would say, really, but uh, is Subban... Uh, from the perspective of playing Pittsburgh as many times as he has over the years. You have, and obviously it wasn't with Sullivan as coach, uh, I understand that, but you have some guys that can really give some uh, intelligence on what's happening with the other team here, I think from a very close perspective. Yeah, I will say this. Um, I don't fault the Montreal Canadiens for what they did in the sense that we knew that they were giving up some youth with Subban but also still getting back a great guy in Shane Weber. They were doing that to, to placate their coach who's no longer their coach. So that's that right. That's the same thing. The, the Rangers did the same thing, getting rid of Marion Gabrick to satisfy John Tortorella, and then Tortorella wasn't there much longer, and then Gab, Gabrick wins the cup with, with L.A. That could happen again, and it, I think maybe ownership will stop having GMs placate certain coaches just because they say that's what they need to do to win, or I don't know if that was said, obviously, but just obviously they, they felt like that was a part of it, so they did trade him, and it didn't work out. So, But now, the plus side of this is, you have made the two biggest personalities in the NHL in the Stanley Cup in Sidney Crosby and P.K. Subban. And actually, people in Montreal are watching, so they will, they will get a lot of views from the Montreal fan base because they're going to want to know what P.K. Subban's saying. And so like a day like today, P.K. Subban will be just as on a, just as big a stage as Sidney Crosby. That's good for the NHL because right now with, with the NBA off till Thursday, they got games one and two to, to by themselves. That's a great point. And I, I think I, I want to go back first to what you said about the coaches uh, that's uh, uh, what you're talking about is something that should have already happened in the NHL because, again, I don't know another sport where I think the coaches are as disposable. You'll, you'll look at uh, uh, the the changing of the guard out there in Los Angeles, a real what-have-you-done-for-me-lately kind of a thing with winning two cups this decade, and they take the broom to everybody. Certainly there's a longer yep. leash in other sports. I always remind people that uh, Quenville, uh, back when he was getting owned uh, by the Red Wings on a regular basis in St. Louis, nobody was talking about him as an all-time great coach, and maybe that was unfair. What did he? What was it right. three, three games into the season, I think, he gets promoted in Chicago? That's how short the leash is sometimes. And you look at LaViolette being there uh, in Nashville. He's kind of a perfect example of that. Wins the Cup in Carolina. He's not there too much longer. Uh, takes uh, you, you were there to watch when he was in Philadelphia and took them to the Cup yeah. Finals a couple of years later. I, my, my same friend uh, with FDH, John Adams, he said recently, it was with LaViolette, his first thought that came to mind is that, like, oh, that guy's bounced around a lot. I, I said, dude, he's been to the Cup Finals twice and won once. It's not that he's a bad coach. It's the nature of the right. NHL. It's really a thing. I can't think of another short, uh, a major sport where the leash is nearly as short as this. No, I mean, it is true, and look, I, I think there's been a lot of unfair articles with Peter Laviolette, how it ended up in Philly. There were a lot of reasons, a lot. Okay. And if people want to go back, just, just Google it. There were tons of things going on, so it really, it, it, it's, it's really unfair to sort of just hang it on the flyers and say, well, they made a big mistake. If they had just held on to them, they'd have won a, they may have been to a cup, too. No. Sometimes it's just not going to work out someplace with a coach after a while. And they saw it, and that was the way it went. So you're right. I mean, I don't know how it is in soccer. So maybe, you know, maybe there's a close parallel in soccer, and I just am not too ignorant to, to be aware of it. Right. <laughs> 
Uh, well, I, I don't I don't know if that is the case necessarily, and uh, you and I don't follow. I'm kidding. I, I have no idea. Yeah, we, we we don't. You and I don't follow soccer nearly to the extent to to, to know about that. No. To be perfectly honest, and I'm I'm always upfront about what I uh, know and don't know. So yeah, I can't really comment there myself. I want to go to the other point here. It's interesting that you raised it because, uh, as I mentioned before, hockey and baseball with you sort of top of the pyramid of major sports. I didn't know if this might be a sore spot to raise with you, but I'm going to raise it nonetheless since you kind of went there. When you're talking about what hockey needs to get out of this final, you've got a situation last year where they really got big-footed by San Jose being in the cup final the same year that Golden State makes it back to the NBA finals back-to-back. Yeah. When you don't yeah. have your own market fully invested in something as huge as a Stanley Cup final, that's not a good thing. Meanwhile, this year you've got, as you said, the trilogy, and it's going to be, you're going to be getting the first two games of the Stanley Cup final in before that happens. But this is one of these things here, and I have just been struck by this, by the sort of global nature of this, and, and just sort of wondering if this trilogy, when you look at, and again, the global scale of this is not necessarily what we're talking about, because we're more talking about the Stanley Cup from a North American perspective, but on a global scale, and looking at this with social media, I think you've got to go back to that another trilogy, I think, the trilogy of Ali fights in the 70s, uh, and then also, of course, the Rumble in the Jungle. And, of course, part of the reason that was a big global thing is that with Manila and Africa, those were two things that actually happened internationally. But the, 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 the way that this whole thing with the matchup of the Warriors and the Cavs has become, like I said, not just a national but now a global obsession. I look at the Stanley Cup final and I'm thinking to myself, going into their centennial year, they need, I think, at minimum, a six or seven game series. They And I think, fortunately for them, it's unlikely to be anything less than that. They need a very thrilling series and they need something that, again, while well, you and I could sit here and watch uh, a one nothing game all throughout. Again, that's not really what appeals to the masses. You've got to get probably at least a 3-2, to 4-3 to three type game. Most of these games going through, a little overtime wouldn't hurt. In short, again, I think they need something to come out of this very, very strong with momentum into that centennial of the year, I would say, to avoid being completely big-footed again by the NBA. How do you see it? Okay, I think that's completely fair, except making me think about Joe Frazier <laughs> is not fair. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 boy, I was not a Muhammad Ali fan, and I'll leave it there. Yeah. Uh, then, with Colton Scissors scoring his hat trick the other day, I brought up a guy who once had three interceptions against the Jets in A.J. Dewey. Uh-huh. I actually brought that up in a broadcast, <laughs> and so I had that flashback because I sort of made the parallel that maybe they were maybe on the equal plane as far as talent for the type of player they were for doing the kind of result that they gave. So now I'm going to get that baggage out of the way <laughs> and, and just say that I think with this, you, you would, look, we've been watching the NHL playoffs just pulverize the NBA playoffs, not from a viewer perspective, although the Pittsburgh-Washington series did great, but some will, some will say, you know, the Kentucky Derby helped that, and maybe it did, but I think it was a little more than that. Uh, so they've been doing great to the point that Charles Barkley has been talking about it on, on the NBA broadcast, and he's been tweeting that he's been interested in the Stanley Cup Finals, and he even bet Ottawa to win the last series. So Charles Barkley has done more than anybody to sort of promote the NHL playoffs. So I think Charles Barkley is going to be a, a big key to this because I don't expect him to talk about the NHL finals while the NBA finals are going on, but he might. <laughs> no, you're right about that. And look, speaking as a lifelong Cavs fan, you get no arguments from me. The NBA playoffs have been a joke thus far because, uh, and I've I've said to people uh, that uh, look, it is not a good thing objectively for a sport when only two teams matter. Having said that, my team is one of the only two, so I'm not complaining personally. But I'm not going to I'm not going to yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be I'd be a moron to really complain about it on a personal note. But again. I, I recognize that. It's not a good thing. However, Russ, you know the reality as well as I do. Nobody's going to remember that the first three rounds completely sucked. 
people are only going to remember right. the last one of it here. And look, nobody's going to give points to the NHL for saying, you know, their first three rounds were really, really good. And then, uh, you know, the, uh, because again, the finals are probably just going to be, let's face it, more or less, more or less again, on par with what we've seen thus far, which have been very, very good playoffs. But yeah. you, you really only get remembered for what comes last. I mean, it's not a fair world. But we're not really going to come out of this remembering, I don't think most people, that the Stanley Cup uh, playoffs were that much better than the NBA playoffs because the NBA playoffs look like they're going to end in fairly epic fashion. And the Stanley Cup uh, playoffs, let's face it, the finals are going to have a tough time, I would say, being that much better than what we've already seen. No, that's fair. And, and they do need to put on a good show. And soon we'll make a prediction and... We'll see if I play into that or not, but I, I think I think we'll see to start with today, this media day, and, and it's funny because even on my own show Friday night on Off the Post, I said that Peter Laviolette has not been on this stage in the sense that how big the NHL media day has gotten for the Stanley Cup, and, and Anthony Vigione, my uh, co-host, took a little umbrage with that because well, what about the Flyers in 2010? What about with Carolina? And I'm like, they didn't have a media day like they have now. Like, everything runs live today from this event, live in Canada the whole time, live from the NHL Network, at least for the press conference where they have the uh, the coaches and GMs speak. And so that's a big deal. That That is a lot more eyeballs just watching it. And I got to say, on the Memorial Day weekend, People have nothing to do but watch TV unless they're going to go out and, you know, eat too much food, which they'll do that too. Oh, absolutely. You're right about that. It's it's a big TV weekend uh, as we're uh, recording this. Again, you know, you, you being on your way to get ready for a media day in Pittsburgh and uh, again, for me, one of my favorite TV sports days of the year, the uh, the, the doubleheader of uh, Monte Carlo and Indy. Uh, for a lot of people, I know it's uh, Indy and Charlotte, but uh, I, don't, I don't necessarily roll that way. I'm not as big in the neck car. I'm more of an open-wheel guy, but you're right about that. But whether it be those sports, whatever, people are sort of more in front of their TVs. Uh, it's a big weekend, I'm sure, for streaming stuff. It uh, kind of makes me wonder yeah. why they didn't release House of Cards this weekend. Uh, but uh, I can wait. I can be patient uh, for the next installment there. But in, in terms of, uh, as you said, some of the, uh, the, the the matchups here, some of the things that we're looking at, some of the keys to the series, I'm looking at as far as key players go. And again, I, I, I guess I, I fall to more of sort of a captain obvious kind of a perspective when I look at the absences of big uh, players here. So my captain obvious thing here. Uh, I'm going to look at Nashville and say, how do uh, players like Arvidsson and Forsberg rise to the occasion, try to help uh, fill the skates of Johansson with him not in there? Uh, and again, Justin Schultz for Pittsburgh, how is he going to do in the absence of Latang? Is he going to continue getting it done? I know for Pittsburgh it's been more of sort of a collective uh, of players getting it done in Latang's absence here as opposed to putting it on one guy. But traditionally you get to the finals and the magnitude of what of the work that has to be done, it's going to fall on one guy. So for me, again, I, I, I'm just looking at it for, I, I, I hate to say more of a surface perspective because I, I hate to kind of do it that way, but uh, even if it is capped and obvious, that's how it's kind of falling to me. Who do you see being some of the key players on either side here to step up? Well, first thing is uh, I'll say that I think Frank Underwood would be rooting for Nashville because <laughs> I think he would look at, I think he would be looking at Peter Laviolette and saying, you know, I like this guy's moxie. <laughs> I like the way he is behind the bench and and some of the things he says, and he's not afraid to say what he thinks. So I think Frank Underwood's secretly pulling for them. <laughs> uh, I think Arkansas will be an important player. I don't I don't know if he'll be a big cup player, but usually, look, Michael Rupp, we didn't expect him to win a Stanley Cup, and he did. I'm sure even today it shocks him that he scored a Stanley Cup winning goal, but he did. So a lot of times it could be guys like that, and I think I think he is a big cog. Colin Wilson will play a big part, whether he's the one or two, to, you know, center. It depends on whether Fisher comes back or not, and and he's a clutch guy. He's done a lot. He's he's done a lot in his career. He's won a Frozen Four, and and so I think that um, he'll be a player. I look at Ryan Ellis, and, and I know he's a player. I know he is a guy that you have to watch out for. Roman Yossi as well. Forsberg definitely the. Uh, the best offensive forward they have will be the most clutch. See, that's the whole thing. You know, now we're talking about clutch. We're talking about guys like Butch Goring, who may 
be one of the greatest of NHL players, but they were clutch in the playoffs. Essetikinen would be invisible in the regular season and be a super super stud in the NHL playoffs. So it's sometimes hard to identify those guys, but those are two good ones for, for the Nashville side. On, on the Pittsburgh side, it's interesting because, you know, last year at Media Day, they had all the big guys up on the big podiums, and everybody else was sort of on these little tables. And I, I went and spoke to the guys on the little tables, and one of those guys was Justin Schultz. And Justin Schultz wasn't really a, a big cog in last year's Stanley Cup at all because Chris Latang was there. I mean, it was understandable, and he was due to the team, and he was a depth player. But what I did learn from Justin Schultz that I had no idea about, and this is after, you know, people might have said he was a, a failure in Edmonton, where I think was more of a coaching failure than a failure on him, that he was a big Pittsburgh Penguins fan, and this was a dream come true just to be on the Penguins in a Stanley Cup situation. Well, now he's, he, he's the number one guy on defense. Like, this is a big moment. Justin Schultz, and I, I do expect really good things out of him for this. Uh, Sidney Crosby, Sidney Crosby. I mean, people can bring up LeBron James in that other sport, <laughs> and I'll tell you, and I'll tell you that Sidney Crosby is, is just as important to the NHL. And so, when everybody is throwing out the, well, LeBron's the greatest player to ever play in the NBA, which I fully disagree with, and someday we'll have a chance to talk about it. He's one of the best. And Sidney Crosby is already one of the best in the NHL. Is he better than Wayne Gretzky? No, not yet. And I always feel like sometimes these guys have more work to do before we just annoy them. But he's pretty. He's done a pretty good job. Uh, I would I would dare say he's almost on the level of his owner and good friend Mario Lemieux, and that's a pretty good hill to climb. He's, he's pretty close to being there, and that's probably blasphemy. And maybe some people in Montreal are throwing things at their computer, but. I'm just saying, this is, you know, where we're at. So Crosby will be big, and Denny Malkin will be big. He, he's been one of the top scorers in the entire playoffs. He is always overshadowed by Sidney Crosby. But I think we all look at him and marvel at the package of size, strength, finesse, and occasional physical play out of him that really make him a huge wild card. Brian Rust and Connor Sheary, two of the most nondescript guys you ever want to see or interview or talk to or walk by on the street and you didn't realize you walked by them become huge in the playoffs and they score big goals at big times i think brian rust will be a huge factor for them and nick Benino will probably be a big factor too because he's come up big in games the biggest thing that the penguins have going for them besides you know matt murray already having a cup and be, and it's funny that murray re-wrestled the job away from Mark Andre Fleury, but he did. Uh, that's been a roller coaster. But besides that, the big strength is is the Penguins up the middle with Crosby, Malkin, and Benino. That's something that's going to be very hard for Nashville to match up against and win faceoffs, and that's that's going to be a, a factor. Those are all very good points, and uh, yeah, uh, on the NBA thing, you're right, and this is the first I'm going to tease this, but uh, we're, we're going to be delving into the uh, greatest player ever discussion in all likelihood sometime this summer and all of that there. I do think, you talk talking about more work to be done, I, I think if Pittsburgh wins again, that uh, you're looking at a situation where Crosby starts to kind of edge into that conversation at some point. I think the thing with LeBron I, I half agree with you. I think it's premature at this point in time, but I look at Tom Brady the way that he has sort of consensus gotten ahead of Joe Montana. I look at LeBron and right. say, barring injury, by age 37 or 38, uh, he may be sort of consensus ahead of the pack at the rate that he's going. With the amount of improvement that he showed in his 14th season, the efficiency, sure. arguably his best season yet. So I think it's a thing where but you... Here, but i got to tell you, i got to tell you, here's why I stopped the conversation dead just for a minute. Yeah. Not to be rude. No, go ahead. But I had a conversation with my own dad maybe 10 years ago, and he was like, Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer ever. And I'm like, Dad, you can't say that. And he's like, why? And I said, well, for good reason. I just heard an interview with Jack Nicholas saying that when he became a dad, that all of a sudden his life changed and his golf habits changed and the way that he toured changed. 
and it really, you know, didn't curtail his career, clearly, because Jack Nicklaus is still the greatest golfer ever, but it changed the way he had to work at his craft. And I said to my dad, you know, this could change Tiger Woods. We don't know. And and then they always bring up the injury factor. Now, I didn't know the injury factor would be as great as it turned out to be for Tiger Woods, but the first factor was being a dad, and that did have an effect on him. So that hasn't had an effect on LeBron James at the moment, but that's what I'm saying. There's life events and things that sometimes preclude these other things to come to fruition, and that's why I'm always hesitant. Exactly. You're right about that. We don't know what, what kind of role injuries are going to play in this. I know my dad is going to appreciate the Jack Nicholas shout out here. Hero of my dad's. He, he went to school the same time as him at Ohio State. I might have been in the, in the same class with him once or twice. We actually met him a couple of years ago uh, down by Atlanta. Uh, his grandkids go to the same school as my niece and nephews uh, oh, go hi. to. Yeah, so it was, uh, that, that was a big thrill uh, personally to uh, get to meet. Uh, him, but I, I, I look at this. One of the things I want to steer back around to when you're talking about strength up the middle for Pittsburgh, obviously that is going to contrast to what's there with Nashville with, with the loss of Johansson in there. And uh, I, from my biased perspective, I will say the sad loss because uh, anybody from uh, America's North Coast will root against Pittsburgh in any sport. So there's no question who I'm rooting for here. But I look at this. Well, I got to tell you this. Right? Yeah. If you remember. Don Demerick had an amazing quote in, in the second period of overtime, and he basically said, and this was, and he quoted Howard Cosell, who I loved. Like, I was a big Howard Cosell fan. I know his grandson, and and so, I, I you know, Howard Cosell lives on in my mind for some reason. Yes. And, and Don Demerick quoted Howard Cosell saying, when you pay, play against any team in Pittsburgh, you are playing against the city of Pittsburgh. And he's right about that. No question about that. That is right, and uh, I, you know, again, I give the devil their due. But I'm looking at this, and again, you know, even if Johansson was in there, matching up with strength up the middle, uh, they're going to have their hands full. That's not a battle they're going to win in all likelihood in the Cup Finals. But I'm looking at this here. When you look at the way that Colton Sissons has stepped up thus far in the playoffs, and everybody's saying, "Oh, you know, totally out of the blue." Uh, well, yes, on the surface. On the other hand, I'm looking at the stat sheet a little bit deeper, 19% uh, successful shot percentage this year. So there's something there that tells you that when the guy is uh, actually shooting the puck, things are going to go fairly well. Not exactly the same thing with Mike Fisher, but sort of. 42 points in 72 games, you look at that and it's like, oh, ho-hum. But that's, not, that's on 15% shot percentage. So I'm looking at this going, to me... The Nashville guys have room to step up here in the postseason based on what they've done in the regular season. Do you agree with that? They do. Okay. Yeah, no, I do. Uh, I think the, the hat trick game has skewed Sisson's shot percentage a little bit, and I think that um, poor goaltending from Jonathan Bernier didn't, didn't work well into that narrative, but it helped his numbers. So, But I do agree. I think I think the playoffs, yeah, you, you have to look at guys that have, that have a high shot percentage in the playoffs because I think for the most part it's going to show you that they rise to the occasion. So that's why I don't care what anybody's regular season numbers are right now. Well, and I'll tell you what, I just want to clarify, that's regular season numbers for Sisson's 19%, which kind of floors me. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, I, I, I'm looking at that, and I, it, it's, it's such a disconnect uh, when I look at yeah. that. And then I see 10 points in 58 games. So you have to ascribe, I suppose, some of that to the system. And regardless of what your percentage is, maybe it's not your job to take shots on net quite as much, but uh, right. it, it is unusual to see that much of a gap between points scored and shot percentage. So it is one of these things, I look at this from the Nashville perspective, you got a lot of guys with pretty good shot percentage here. So when it comes to collectively filling the skates of Ryan Johansson, because again, that's going to be the key for them, I think. They, they haven't played as long without Johansson as Pittsburgh has played without Latang. 
Pittsburgh has basically, right. to this point, collectively sort of gotten the job done. Although, as we talked about earlier with Justin Schultz, eventually you get to the finals, the mantle is going to be more on one person traditionally than doing it by committee. I, I think uh, the, the offensively, that's a different story sometimes than the blue line. I think offensively, you, you can still kind of continue forward with more of a collective. And when you look at the shot percentage of some of the guys that are expected to do that for Nashville, maybe it's a little bit easier to project that they're going to be successful. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. And, and I do think there's a lot of room for those guys to rise. And, and I think you, you make a good point. When you're talking about a guy like Sissons, he did have one really nice uh, one-timer goal, but most of his goals are going to be scored and down low in the crease, and they're going to be dirty, ugly goals. And I think Nashville is going to have to score their fair share of dirty, ugly goals if they want to win this series. They definitely are, and again, great strength for them on the blue line. Uh, it, it's a team that really yep. has a lot of balance. You, you talk about veteran leadership uh, with, with uh, Rene and Nett. So there's that. Uh, everybody pretty much who follows hockey knows what Pittsburgh brings the Bears, the defending champions. And you talked about Malkin before. Just a quick point I want to make on that is, is that you talked about him being somewhat in the shadow of Crosby unfairly. Uh, when you're playing with probably the greatest player of your generation, that's going to happen. I would argue as well, uh, when, when you look at the time frame of coming into the NHL, somewhat unfairly, I think, additionally in the shadow of Ovechkin as a fellow Russian who came in because the thought was, oh, Crosby and Ovechkin, best players of the generation, blah, blah, blah. You look at Malkin, and it's hard not to make the case that he's had the better career at this point. Yeah. It's, again, he, he is going to go down as one of the greats. He might be the best Russian player, if nothing else, in this generation, but Alex Ovechkin gets credit for that because he's probably the best goal scorer of his generation. And so, it's tough for him. It, it, this is, Crosby and Ovechkin have really killed Malkin's buzz while he's playing. But I have a feeling that when Evgeny Malkin hangs it up, that he will get his due. And maybe, you know, like you said, maybe move ahead of one or two of those guys that were mentioned in, in Crosby and Ovechkin. But while they're playing, I don't, I don't think that's possible. Right, and I don't think it's going to be uh, Crosby, uh, you know, that, that he does. But uh, it, right. it, I mean, anything's possible at this point. And and, and again, uh, yep. everything for Crosby, uh, much like what we were saying about with LeBron earlier. When you're talking about the all-time status, it's going to be built on how you finish, what the back nine of your career looks like, what the longevity yep. is. And with Crosby here in the finals, this is going to uh, be a part of painting the picture for that. So uh, again. Uh, a fascinating matchup on both sides. Again, from a purist perspective, uh, everybody would rather see it with Latang and Johansson in there. Uh, it definitely is something that where it, where it loses a little bit of luster for not having those guys there. But again, the two teams that have made it through the wars at this point, a very tough path. You talked about it with Pittsburgh before. And yes, the tougher of the two paths. Having said that, for, for Nashville, uh, the fact that uh, St. Louis on paper was the easiest matchup that they got tells you something because that's the team that made it to the conference finals last year. St. Louis, no pushover. You, you look at going through Chicago the way that they did, Anaheim the way that they did. I just had a feeling about Nashville when they blew through Chicago. And again, not to be Captain Obvious, but I'm looking at this going, boy, there may not be anything that stops them from making it all the way through the Western Conference at this point because I didn't think it was just a one-round dynamic the way that they handled the Blackhawks the way that they did. Uh, a young team that's coming together, and again, you look at it, and they still had Johansson in there at the time, and, and you look at it like maybe it's their time. I, I, I joked about this uh, at one point previously that uh, uh, it, it's oversimplifying, but I'm watching that first-round matchup with them in Chicago, and I'm hearing the John Cena music in, in, the, in my head. You know, you know, your time is up, my time is now. That's oversimplifying about Chicago. But if you're going to say my time is now as a Predators fan, I, for one, am not going to argue with you because they got everything going their way right now. I look at it. You made the comment on Facebook the other night about Pittsburgh. Well, really about Pittsburgh and Ottawa, that whoever comes out of this double OT game seven in what's been a very tough series already, a brutal series, a lot of hits, yeah. a lot of injuries sustained. I'm looking at yeah. that, and again, I've been wrong the last two years. I've gone with... Uh, 
you know, my, my picks there. This reminds me of when I was wrong two years ago. I thought it was Tampa Bay's time, and it wasn't. But my pick, I'm yeah. going with Nashville in six. I'm riding the hot team at this point, a team that, again, when you say the 16 seed, I say lies, damned lies, and statistics because the regular season just isn't really that relevant sometimes when it comes to the Stanley Cup final, as we've said. I'm, I'm going with Nashville to keep riding this streak through. If Pittsburgh was fresher coming into this, if they had all their guns, I think it would be a different story. But this is the world we live in right now. This is the lineups on both sides. Uh, I'm going to be in the minority. I'm going with Nashville in six. How do you see it? Well, it, you know, we could go with the battle of food. It could be for Manny Brothers against the hot chicken. <laughs> uh, that would be a good matchup. We could, we could, I don't know if we could go with a matchup of pizza because I've been already getting killed by, by Pittsburgh fans because I mentioned the other night when they were going in between periods, between first overtime and second overtime, a lot of times players will eat pizza, but there's, I've never found good pizza in Pittsburgh. I think it's lousy. <laughs> and and so I, I drew the ire of, of some Pittsburghers for that. I'm not even going to think I could find pizza in Nashville because if I'm there, I'm not eating pizza. So we're not going to go there. I think the matchup here is interesting. I do feel what I wrote is, is accurate in the sense that Pittsburgh will have more banged up players, but they do have the experience of being there. And I think that's huge. And the one guy who's not banged up is their goalie, Matt Murray. Oddly enough, he got enough rest while he was hurt that he sort of came back fresh where Pekka Rene has really had to expend a lot of energy just to get here. And I'm not saying he's going to look bad, but I'm just saying he could be a little more mortal. And I, I wouldn't be totally shocked because it's a lot of this has been on his shoulder. So, end of the day, I'm going Pittsburgh in five. And that's just because it's a gut feeling. It has nothing to do with underestimating Peter Laviolette, who I know is a great coach, or that Nashville team, or, or the sway that they have right now. I think that right now with Pittsburgh having home ice these first two games, Nashville has to win one of these first two games. If they don't win one of these first two games, then I think my, my prediction of Pittsburgh and five looks really good. If Nashville wins one of them, then it doesn't look so good. But I'm sticking with it. Well, I'll tell you what, you circle back to what we were saying before uh, in terms of what would be good for the NHL. If it was an anticlimactic final like that, uh, that would not be uh, very good from the league perspective here. Yeah, it gives you the Pittsburgh dynasty talk, but at the expense of uh, a thrilling final. So that will be interesting to see how it plays out. I will just tell you in terms of Pittsburgh cuisine, I will tell you from going to Pirates games uh, occasionally here and there, uh, love the grilled uh, I, I am a big, big fan. I'm not a hot dog eater per se very much, but I, I love all uh, pretty much most types of kosher hot dogs for whatever reason, though. The flavor of them, they've got grilled foot-long yeah. kosher dogs. They're out of this world. Uh, and I have there you to. Go. I've never heard anybody talk about that. That's good. Yeah, yeah. You can get those at the ballpark. And I always go back to this, too. I had the quintessential. Pittsburgh experience the one time I was at the ballpark and it was cuisine wise. I'm standing in line at the concession stand behind a small blonde child with of course the obligatory Pittsburgh rat tail who orders fried cheese. And I go, that this is it. This is the quintessential Pittsburgh moment in a snapshot, Russ. <laughs> you know? It just awesome. you can't encapsulate the city any better than that experience, I'm afraid. But uh it is going to be uh, a very, very interesting uh, final here. Enjoy it. Uh, it is going to be uh, something, again, you know, a, a rare opportunity for you to cover it here because, yeah, like you said, if it was Anaheim in there, I, I don't see good old Russ Cohen hopping on a Greyhound to get out to Anaheim for the West Coast games here. So, uh, you know, the fact that uh, Nashville's within driving distance for you is a rare opportunity here as far as covering it in different arenas. So, uh, you know... Uh, how much uh, you enjoy covering it. And, of course, everybody can stay right on top of it at Sportsology. And I know that you're going to have uh, plenty of audio there and uh, plenty of coverage in the days yep. to come. Thanks, Rick. All right, thanks very much for being a part of this, Russ. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this joint episode of Sportsology Radio and the FDH Lounge. 
As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, All Clear Channel Affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QVC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse and the Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 